Special meeting of the Board of Education is now called to order. Roll call. Geiger. Present. Meek. Moore. Here. Myers. Here. Thompson. Here. Williams here. Weiniger. Here. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Um, Item number four and five are both public comment, and we did not have any sign up for public comment. So we will move to number six, the approval of purchase and sale agreement for 10235 Park Glenway. 10 minute presentation. Okay. Um, good evening. First of all, thank you for um, taking your time to do a special meeting for this cause. We are incredibly grateful that all of you um, put your calendars together and decided to do this for the sake of um, our purchase for a building for all of our most vulnerable kids. We are over the moon about um, the possibility of this building. The presentation I posted is the same one that you saw, so I'll just be fast for as a reminder for the public who might be watching, because um, I know we don't really have very many people from the public here, but whoever might be watching the live stream. Um, just as a quick overview, this is a former Colorado Early Colleges building. Well, it's currently a Colorado Early Colleges building that is available in Parker, two stories, about 20,000 plus square feet. Um, 20, what does that say? 23,000, 24,000 square feet. Um, it's a good price, it's a great location. We have had, as you know, um, students at the location on Dransfeld in essentially mobiles for the bridge program in Parker, as well as for the child find program. And we're excited to be able to move these um, students and those programs into a really nice building. And we're also excited about the possibilities for the future. So here are some pictures just that you've already seen. Um, and again, the two programs being moved that would be moved immediately would be the Child Find program in Parker. Um, and this program, first of all, it's near and dear to my heart because I took my daughter to Child Find when she was 18 months old. She is 25 today. And a lot of the things that the Child Find folks here in Douglas County were able to identify and support her with um, have made a huge difference in the trajectory of her life and the things she was able to do. The Child Find program and folks are especially near and dear to my heart. Um, and we certainly want all of our families with, their, with our youngest, youngest kids to have a good impression of our school district and to really see how much we care about their kids and how much we care about our most vulnerable learners. Um, so again, you've, you've heard all of this and I certainly have uh, both Deputy Superintendent Hyatt, uh, Hyatt as well as Director Meyer here for um, to answer any questions you might have. This is the current facility that our child find folks are in. Um, it's, it is actually not a mobile, it's a little house that was built a very, very, very long time ago um, with a basement with really deep window wells. Um, it's just a very unfortunate facility that isn't perfect, although the, the staff who work there are amazing and have absolutely made the most out of it to make sure they're taking care of our kids. Um, likewise, our Parker Bridge program, these are our students who are um, the between 18 and 21 um, with significant special needs and we serve them also at that Dransfield site. They are in a mobile class, mobile classrooms. Um, and, and again, the staff there is amazing and the program is amazing. And we would love to be able to provide them with a facility that reflects how amazing the staff is um, and the program. And so here's some pictures of our current um, mobile classrooms that our Parker Bridge facility is located in. Um, the parking lot is awfully crowded for all the buses because of course all of these students require transportation. Um, Finally, the next steps in the timeline. So um, I'd like to remind the public that where this money is coming from is the sale of the West Glen, West, West Glen, suddenly, 
Westridge, Westridge, Westridge Glen, I suddenly lost it, on um, property in Highlands Ranch that we just closed on um, this earlier this year. And so we raised $4.9 million from that property that was a surplus property that we were able to sell to a developer. Um, that's very unusual. We we shouldn't certainly shouldn't expect to be able to get $4.9 million for literally any of our other properties, but that was just a very unique circumstance. So we have that $4.9 million, um, and we would like to use that $4.9 million in order to purchase this building. We had planned on building a 10,000 square foot building on the existing Dransfeld site. 10,000 square feet is about the most we could put on that site. It would have cost our taxpayers through a bond somewhere between seven and $10 million for 10,000 square feet to house these two programs. This building is 24,000 square feet. It is less than half the price that our taxpayers would have paid to build 10,000 square feet. So in addition to it being, of course, the right thing to do for our children, um, it is an absolute bargain for our taxpayers and really good use of our taxpayer dollars. Um, the purchase and sales agreement is attached to the agenda item, along with a resolution authorizing, um, authorizing the superintendent to enter into the purchase and sales agreement. Um, Council Klemesh, would you like to say any more about how that actually works? And then we'll be happy between all of us to take your questions. Sure, so there is a resolution that has been posted with the PSA agreement, and that essentially asks the board to, number one, and most importantly, approve the purchase and acquisition of this property. And, um, and the essential terms of that agreement um, was posted so that you would have an opportunity to approve the purchase and sale, or at least to know what the purchase and sale agreement terms would be. The most important terms in there address the feasibility period, which gives the district the authority to go in and carefully look at the property, do the due diligence necessary to determine whether or not the acquisition for $4.3 million still makes sense in light of looking underneath the cover, so to speak, all of the intricate details of those things that could be costly to the district or to assure the district that what they are purchasing actually is consistent with what is seen after the feasibility and diligence is completed. Um, your authorization would authorize and give our Superintendent Kane the authority to enter into the PSA to actually take all of the actions necessary to effectuate the ultimate acquisition of the property. And there could be, for example, some things that come up that would require us to make objections to the title when we actually conduct our own uh, diligence with respect to the title of the property or ask questions regarding that. And to the extent that um, our, we need an, uh, administrative questions to proceed to complete the transaction, the passage of the resolution actually gives our superintendent the authority to take care of those administrative functions as promptly and efficiently as possible. So that is uh, the recommendation that we are asking the board to approve this evening, is to uh, pass the resolution authorizing the superintendent to effectuate the purchase and sale agreement. I do believe, and I'm looking at the purchase and sale agreement at this time, that to the extent that the signatures are here, that it may also authorize um, our board president and secretary to sign as well. But I certainly want the board to know that you can do that with the understanding that there may be the need to amend or alter some of those less uh, material terms of the PSA, and you would be giving our superintendent the authority to make those modifications. So with that, we are happy to take any questions that you have. Um, well, I am very excited about this opportunity that landed uh, in our lap. Uh, just a question about the renovations. How much are we looking at spending on that? Because if we were going to purchase or build a building for seven to ten million, like what are we looking at? Thank you for that question. Um, we have done. We have been through the building with an architect to look at what changes we need to make 
in the near term in order to bring in um, those two programs and be able to run those programs. And then there are, of course, ideal changes that we would make for um, the longer term. So we don't have pricing yet from the architect about what that looks like, but it is nowhere near in the neighborhood of making it um, anywhere near the seven to $10 million mark that the other building was. Uh, the changes in the near term, maybe in the couple hundred thousand range, of course, we have to make sure that the building has all of our security, you know, our, our badge entry and cameras and all of those pieces, um, along with some other just really pragmatic things like a new sink and stove and changing tables and those kinds of things. Um, did I catch the big ones? Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add, CEO Cosgrove? Okay. So we are having the architects look at it, but in terms of the changes that we need to make for these two programs to run out of that building, it's very minimal. And we would use the remaining Westridge Glen balance um, to be able to make those changes so that we're continuing to work from that same pot. So it's like we traded one site for a much better site with a building on it. So, And the potential to sell another site. And the potential to sell another site, yeah. Great. Any other questions? Director Meek. Yeah, no questions. I, I really just want to thank the staff for all of the work that they put into this. I know it's an extra meeting tonight, but I think having the opportunity for our community to learn and ask questions is really important. And I think all we've heard um, from public comment to gather at the building on a Saturday to take everyone um, on a walkthrough. And I watched um, Deputy Superintendent Hyatt and Director Meyer like they were kids in a candy store. <laughs> Running all through, running some, some all through the building, just being so excited about the possibilities for our kids with special learning needs and what they, you know, I mean, from one room to another, oh, and we could do this in here, and we could do this in here. So I just, um, I can't thank them enough for their enthusiasm for our kids, and um, we are all excited about this possibility. As you said, President Williams, this is something that really did sort of land in our laps, and um, you know what an amazing. Thing to be in a position and to have a board that's so supportive of um, moving forward with something like this for our kids. Great. Director Moore. You know, I don't know, we don't have any public here tonight to speak in favor or uh, against this, this topic, but I wanted to point out that since we brought this up in the last probably 60 days or 45 days, all the messages I've received, email or comments have all been in favor of the board doing this. Director Geiger. I'm only going to disagree slightly. This is not just fallen on a lap. This is the result of our administration carefully evaluating what our needs are, carefully evaluating our resources, looking for ways to meet those needs with the available resources. This is how a public agency should operate and protect the taxpayer's money. So while I appreciate everybody kind of saying we fell into this, that's not true. This was really hard work by good people doing it the right way. And I appreciate all of that effort from the entire administration. We all thank you, thank you. All right, so with that, do I have a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the district's acquisition of 10 235 Park Way? Moved. Second. Moved by Geiger, second. Oh, I'm sorry, by Moore, uh, second by Weiniger. Um, roll call, Geiger. Aye. Meek. Aye. Moore. Aye. Myers. Aye. Thompson. Aye. Williams. Aye. And Weiniger. Aye. Great. Passes seven to zero. Congratulations. <laughs> Very exciting. Great. And then going to move on to the next agenda item number seven uh, that was added last week or 10 days ago-ish, Potential School Finance Act Funding State Legislation Changes, 30-minute information presentation. Okay, um, again, this meeting was very well-timed, so thank you again for um, your support in uh, holding this meeting. Um, there have been a lot of proposals happening at the legislature around school funding, as there often are. But this year in particular has been perhaps more active than um, recent years. 
Um, and the, as I've mentioned to all of you, the speaker, we talked about at the last meeting actually, the speaker of the house has been working on a very well-intentioned proposal um, around reshuffling the formula to be more student-based um, and to make sure that we're caring for and funding our rural districts. So um, certainly the, the best of intentions. Um, however, the unintended consequences of that formula have been pretty significant. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But I wanna level set us with just some interesting facts. Um, this chart shows spending in Colorado versus the national average for um, students. So this is per, per pupil uh, spending for students for education, for K-12 education. Um, the national average, of course, is up there at the zero mark. And there are three different sources for the Colorado's number, um, including the US Census, Education Week, and NCES. So you can see from three different sources, they calculate things in their own way. But all of them come to the conclusion that we are quite a bit lower than the national average in terms of education spending. Um, what's really interesting, if, if you start at fiscal year 10, you can see that massive drop um, that happens over the course of 10 years plus there. That is, of course, um, an impact of the budget stabilization factor that we have talked about before. Um, we've only now started to bring education spending back up post-COVID. Um, post I tell you this for a very important reason. We are about $2,000 per student um, under the national average, and this is an extremely significant number. Um, depending on who's measuring it today, these numbers are a little old. It's between $1,000 and $2,000 per student. Um, I want to tell you just a little bit, or remind our public, I know you know this, but remind our public a little bit about how school finance in Colorado already works. This is super high level. But essentially, the state of Colorado, um, under the School Finance Act from 1994, and I, I want to point out 1994 was a long time ago, and the needs of students, um, the needs of school systems have shifted a lot since 1994. Um, essentially, we get base funding, and that base funding under Amendment 23 should have inflation applied each year. We get student-based weights, so this is based on the characteristics of the students in your district around students living in poverty as well as multilingual learners. We have district-based adjustments, so a teeny tiny district cannot educate their 10 kids for $10,000 a student. Um, larger districts can do it for a little less, but there are also challenges associated with larger districts, so this makes an adjustment for the size. It also makes an adjustment for cost of living. This is one that advantages Douglas, helps us not have even worse funding than we currently have um, because it's really, really expensive to live in Douglas County. And of course, our teachers can't even afford to share a one bedroom apartment um, in Douglas County. So there's a cost of living factor that impacts us, Boulder, um, a district like Aspen, et cetera. Um, and then there's personnel costs, which is similar. And then we subtract the budget stabilization factor, which we're happy to say is now um, has now been zeroed out, at least under the School Finance Act, as it was introduced last week. Those factors all go into getting our total program funding. And then we do receive program uh, funding outside of the formula for special education. Does not come anywhere close to covering special education. It's about 18% or so of our actual special education costs. Um, English language acquisition, gifted and talented, career and technical education and transportation. Um, transportation, I'd just like to point out, also does not fund transportation. We lose somewhere around 20 to $22 million a year on transportation after this revenue is applied. That's very common. Um, every school district loses, most of them lose more than we do, but um, transportation is also not fully funded. So there's almost nothing up here that is fully funded. Um, <laughs> All right, the School Finance Act bill is introduced each year in the legislature, kind of defining, here's what we're doing, here's what inflation is, here's how we're meeting the law. Um, and that bill was introduced last week with a uh, CPI of 5.2%, which is what we expected. Um, a final buy down of the budget stabilization factor, so zeroing out, that's what we expected. And they, the last minute they added ongoing funding for the rural districts. Our rural districts are chronically underfunded. Um, it's, it's been a known fact for a while. We all know that they are, and, and any um, big district superintendent colleague that I've ever talked to, we all support 
getting a little more funding to our rural districts because they are truly underfunded. So we were happy to see that ongoing funding for rural districts. Okay, so all of that to say, what is the speaker's proposal and how is that different than the School Finance Act? Um, so the speaker's proposal is just that. It's a proposal. It is not yet a bill. Um, it has not been drafted into a bill, so there are many, many, many details that are just not known. Um, I tried to put a bulleted summary of the proposal. She's proposing a six-year phase-in. It's unclear what that looks like. She believes the cost will be about $498 million a year at full phase-in. So presumably that full 498 wouldn't be spent the first year. We'd spend some portion of that getting all the way up to 498 a year. But that's $498 million a year that is not currently in existence. Um, that funding is it would have to be found somewhere. Um, it would increase student weights to 25%. So again, for at-risk ELL, and would add special education as a student weight. Um, it would cap the size factor to 6,500 students, and it would cap the cost of living faster. These are the, these are the two things that are um, very challenging for our district. It would add a new remoteness factor to help the rurals, um, and it would create, it would create a funding floor of the current year funding. So um, you wouldn't be able to be le funded less than the current year funding. It is unclear if the funding floor is changed each year by inflation. No one's been able to get a clear answer on that. Um, as a district that is always going to be the funding floor, um, that's extremely challenging for us. So if we are looking at a funding floor of the funding we have going into next year, um, even if even if inflation were applied, we would not be able to give inflationary increases to our educators because our expenses increase every year as well. Um, and so if our funding goes up 2.5%, that doesn't mean that we can give a 2.5% increase. We usually have to give an increase that is something less than that because we also have to cover the escalating expenses that go with inflation. Um, and it would implement four-year averaging. We are currently benefiting from five-year averaging. Um, so these are the concerns, and this is not certainly not just Douglas County's concerns. Um, over the last two weeks, I've been working closely with many of my colleagues um, across the state, really, um, but primarily kind of here in the metro area. And some of my colleagues have been able to meet with the speakers, some have not. Um, We've all been told of something a little bit different, and we all share these concerns. Um, number one is sustainability. 500 million a year is a significant amount of money. There is an education fund, but it is a one-time source of money, and we already know that the Healthy Lunches for All program was underfunded by about 50 million if, if memory serves. So that will be coming out of the one-time education fund, um, at least this year, probably though from here on out because it's underfunded. Um, there's also the uh, CSI mill levy um, match was also underfunded or underestimated. That is also coming out, that came out at about the uh, tune of 25 million or so. Um, out of the education fund. So her her plan is relying on $500 million a year coming from a finite funding source that could probably only fund that for um, a few years at most. Um, that's, that's issue number one. And truly, if that funding source, when that funding source runs out, the districts that will fall off a cliff are the ones who have received the most benefit from the, the speaker's proposal. Um, those districts are going to fall off a big cliff. We would, we would fall off a tiny cliff relative to those districts. Um, okay, Amendment 23, it is unclear where inflation is accounted for in the proposal. Um, whether inflation is going to be distributed as it should be on a district by district basis, so every district gets an inflationary increase each year, or whether she's considering it as part of the $500 million pot. Um, inequitable student-based funding. So I do want to address this one as best I can. The intention is to drive more resources to our neediest students. That is absolutely the intention. Here in Douglas County, we have 8,000 students in poverty. That is more students in poverty than the entirety of Mapleton School District. 
um, we have a lot of students in poverty. What this does to us is essentially holds us flat, gives us a slightly more dollars per pupil, but lots more dollars per student to other districts. Um, it essentially holds us flat. And if we're flat and the intention is somehow that we're getting more money for our 8,000 students in poverty, the only way that we could actually put resources, additional resources towards the 8,000 students in poverty, which would be the intention of this legislation, would be to cut programming across every school in our district. So in other words, in order to have more money for students in poverty as the legislation intends, we'd have to cut art as an example across every single school in our entire district, including for those in poverty, in order to have more resources for students in poverty. And that really is because there isn't adequate base funding. And what they're doing is essentially cutting that base funding to stack on student-based funding. So if we were to cut our base, cutting our base means eliminating student programming um, across our district and then taking the money we've shaved off the top by eliminating student programming and allocating that just towards um, our neediest students. So the, the intentions behind, um, behind her proposal are absolutely very, very well intentioned. The unintended consequences is that our students in poverty don't receive an additional benefit, whereas um, a district like Denver would receive something like $1,000 more per student. I mentioned that national average because as a state, we've been really upset that we are behind the national average by $1,000 to $2,000 per student. The way the funding formula works today, we receive $1,000 less per student under the funding formula than Denver Public Schools. We already receive $1,000 less per student than Denver Public Schools under the School Finance Act. If this were to be implemented, that gap would go from 1,000 to 2,000. I'm not even talking about MLOs here. The MLO gap between us is another 2,000. So let's just set that aside. I'm not talking about MLOs. This is just School Finance Act. So what, it, what, what it's causing is this bigger, um, this bigger disparity between districts, especially here in the metro area, and we're all competing for teachers, we're all competing for the same things. Um, so that's, hopefully that was a good explanation of the student-based funding. Um, student count and averaging, she has not said she is changing, well she is changing averaging, but she hasn't said she's changing how students are counted. But when we fall short, we often go to changing how students are counted, or we go to the BS factor. So there is a fear by a lot of my colleagues that this would just mean the reintroduction of the um, budget stabilization factor at some point in the future. And then finally, um, our last concern is the timing of the proposal. The um, interim school finance task force has also been tasked with paying two um, independent outside contractors to um, do an adequacy study in Colorado to do a, a funding adequacy study. So they would go look at districts and see what does it really take to provide um, a K-12 student in the state of Colorado or in a particular district or a student with particular characteristics, what does it really take to provide them with a high quality education? So that the results of those adequate, that adequacy study would seem to be necessary before we start changing um, the formula. Um, that is one of the, just one of the challenges with the timing. The other challenge is, there is um, a ballot initiative proposed for November, this November, um, to cap property taxes. Capping property taxes would have a tremendous impact on the state budget and a tremendous impact on local budgets and a tremendous impact on K-12 education. So until we know what that's going to look like, it would also seem that rearranging the formula without additional sustained ongoing funding is a bad plan. So um, I sent you all the letter that we sent to the speaker. Um, I drafted the letter Saturday morning. We've been we're trying to respond to everything throughout spring break and throughout the weekend, um, along with Douglas County Schools, Boulder Valley School District, Jeffco, um, Cherry Creek, and Littleton have all signed the letter, along with about half a dozen districts. Um, that are south of us, including highly diverse districts that would that would extremely be extremely advantaged by these changes, including very small rural districts that would be extremely advantaged by some of the changes. Um, we just all really feel that we shouldn't be changing the formula without having ongoing funding and making sure that we have an adequate base 
to fund all students in the state of Colorado. Um, so that kind of frames the issue. So before I get to a potential resolution, I just want to see if we can answer any questions. Director Thompson. Thank you. The adequacy study that you mentioned, um, do you know what the timeline is on that? Do you know? Director Meek knows. Yeah, it's supposed to be available before the 2025 legislative session. So the next legislative session. Director Geiger. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. I want to clarify where we at, what's in front of the legislature now, and what we're mm -hmm. concerned about coming, right? Yes. We currently have SB 24188. That is correct. Which is the standard public school financing bill that we have to have every year. With the addition of ongoing rural funding. With the addition of ongoing rural funding and the elimination of the aptly named BS factor. Correct. <laughs> Technically stands for budget stabilization. <laughs> I'm aware of that. So our concerns about the recalculation of the factors has not yet been put in front of the legislature, correct? That is correct, and in fact, I do, I thank you for asking that, I do wanna make one more clarification. Senate Bill 24-188 affects how we are funded for the 24-25 school year. The speaker's proposal, once it is put into a bill form, if it's put into a bill form, will take effect for the 25-26 school year. Um, and as Director Meek pointed out, the adequacy studies will be in theory, completed in time for the legislative session preceding the 25-26 school year. So that legislative session would seem to be a better time to um, have these discussions. Okay, so what we were afraid of is that the, all these changes, the recalculation was gonna come in this legislative session. Still are, yes. And still remain that concern. Um, but we do not have the details of that bill yet. And it sounds like that's still being negotiated at some level before it's being in initiated, correct? Yes, you are correct. We have um, gone back and forth, many, uh, not, not certainly not just Douglas County, many superintendents um, on all, uh, kind of all perspectives on this issue have, have been talking to the speaker. I do think she has landed on her final approach. This is the first approach where she's actually released number runs. Um, and so I think she's getting close to a bill, should she choose to put a bill forward at all. Okay, and I assume Case and Casby are deeply involved in discussions with all members of the legislature about this as well. Yes, that is correct. In fact, today, I believe, Casby came out with um, a communication strongly supporting Senate Bill 24-188. Um, and you know you, we can interpret that however we want, but that's a strong support for that bill. We certainly strongly support 24-188. And um, Case has continually taken the position that they do not believe that the formula should be changed such that um, we're taking money from some districts to allocate it to other districts, again, without um, a sustained revenue source to be able to rearrange the formula so that you're not creating winners and losers. That has always been the position of case. Um, they are continuing to talk to the speaker and there is no bill, as you pointed out, to officially take a position on. Um, we are all just trying to get as far ahead of it as we possibly can because the consequences for um, many of our districts would be extremely um, negative. And one technical question, you provided us and attached to the agenda a, a run of potential costs, et cetera. Who, was this provided by the speaker's office? Is this done? This is the speaker's initial proposal. That is correct. Um, and I don't know how many of our voters will look at this. Um, the, the variation in change to various districts is astonishing. Some districts get under this proposal, as much as $3,000 a year increase per student. Others, also tiny, lose up to $105 a year. I am... It, it feels... Um, random. Not very well thought out because just it, it's part of the point is to help rural districts. And if you look at that, some districts are actually losers, even with $498 million 
being added, um, such as Mesa and Yuma, and that is extremely puzzling to me. I'm looking at a 57 student district, Liberty School District, uh, which might lose as much as $100 per student. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Director Weiniger. Yeah, my question was actually very similar, just the difference between this and Senate Bill 188, because this isn't an, an amendment to it. This is um, a totally separate bill that potentially could get um, put out there by the speaker, correct? Yes, that is correct. It is a completely separate bill because it would not impact the 24-25 School Finance Act. Um, it really, it's, it's actually, there, there's a lot of questions around that too, about the ability to obligate a future legislative body. You're basically trying to pass a School Finance Act for 25-26, which um, from looking at Director Meek's face is what she was about to say, um, you're, you're committing a future legislative body and that's that's mm -hmm. questionable um, at best. Thank you. And I just also want to say I really appreciate your efforts on all the work you've put into really understanding this proposal and reaching out to other school districts and not just trying to speak as one school district, trying to really understand how everyone or a lot of other districts feel in this state. And I think your letter was really well put together. So thank you for that. Thank you. And truly, I have to give my colleagues credit. I, I certainly um, drafted the initial draft, but... Um, Superintendent, um, Superintendent Dorland from Jeffco, Superintendent Anderson from um, Boulder, Superintendent Smith from Cherry Creek has been incredibly supportive for you know the last two weeks. Um, Superintendent Lambert from Littleton Public Schools, um, Superintendent Burhazel from Thompson School District, truly have all been really, really amazing. Director Meek. Yeah, thank you for all the work on this. Um, I mean, as someone who's really focused on statewide funding measures in the past, we need more statewide funding. Um, just a matter of fact, um, it's not uncommon for states to change their school finance formula, but no other state has ever changed it without a new revenue source at the same time. And so this would be changing it without a new revenue source. Um, the revenue source that would be needed would be 500 million in ongoing funds to make the school finance formula more equitable across districts. And I definitely could argue both sides of this. Um, you know, we have come back from the, you know, we've surpassed our pre-pandemic scores and every, subject, every grade level. And I think part of that, you know, is because of our amazing, amazing staff and our community. And it leads into funding factors as well that go into the school finance formula. I can't support changing the school finance formula without a new funding source. But I encourage us to think just how complex this is. And if we really do support all kids, all kids even within our own district, like our own district, we have our own finance formula to try to be as equitable as possible. So I just, I just want to point out, we need more statewide funding, period. We need to fund our schools adequately. And... You know, you were looking at the categorical funding areas. So basically, locally, we fund 65% of special education costs statewide, 80% of English learner costs, 69% of gifted and talented costs, 76% of CTE, and 77% of transportation. That's how much we're funding, minus, you know, the other part that's funded is state and federal. Um, it's really complex, and I appreciate the intent behind trying to make things more equitable across districts, and I think we need to have more funding in order to do that. And so this is a really challenging conversation because I'd like to see our board lead in having that conversation. I'd like to see our board lead in 
educating legislators in the community as to how important it is to adequately fund our schools. I mean, it's disgraceful. It's 2,000 less per student, you know, from the national average. And so anyway, I do have some suggested uh, changes to the verbiage in the resolution once we get there. But I did think everyone would appreciate knowing it's not strange to want to change the school finance formula, but it's unprecedented to do it without more funding in order to alleviate pitting districts against each other. If I, if I could, President Williams. Sure. Just, just to add to that, I do think one of the unfortunate side effects, um, as Director Meek pointed out, has been we're, we're trying really hard to make sure that we're standing by our colleagues and, and staying together as, as superintendents and as a statewide K-12 ed education system. This process and the way that the process played out has resulted in pitting districts against each other. Um, we have great relationships um, among all of us, but that has been really challenging to, to go to one district and waive you know, $1,000 more per student or more um, in front of them if they would just support this one thing while another district has devastating impacts um, is, is really, really challenging. This is, it's just been a, it's been a hard process and I do really wanna shout out particularly um, Superintendent Dorland and Jeff Coe and Superintendent Anderson in Boulder as we have worked really hard as a group with our front range superintendents to try to hold on to unity um, and to make sure that we're, we're all trying to step in each other's shoes and understand what it is like to be in each other's districts. Um, we have challenges here in Douglas County that we are waiting in every single day, but our colleagues in the rural districts have completely different challenges that they are waiting in every single day. And our colleagues in highly impacted, concentrated poverty districts have extremely difficult challenges that they're waiting in every single day. And I think it is so important for us to have the time when we're thinking about changing a formula to have the time to be able to work on it together and to be able to step into each other's shoes and really figure out what would be an equitable distribution of resources. Um, and we did that in 2018 when I served um, Douglas County as the interim superintendent all of the state superintendents got together. It took us a year to come up with a proposed formula that could only go into place if there were additional revenue for distributing that additional revenue. And we all worked together. We ran a million different scenarios. We compromised with each other. We shared each other's issues. We understood where everyone was coming from. And we all came to an agreement. Denver Public Schools and Douglas County School District signed off on the same formula that we all came to an agreement on. Um, and so that, I believe, is really how a process like this should work um, with the um, addition of an ongoing sustainable revenue source. And I also want to add, I do think it's important for that sustainable ongoing revenue source to provide a return on investment for our taxpayers, including our taxpayers. Director Myers. While we talk about complexity, I, I guess I cannot really grasp after we've spent the past how many years just trying to educate our own Douglas County about while we're a wealthy district, this school funding act, it isn't as if we get all this money because we are this wealthy district and now we'd have to turn around if this was to happen and then educate now while we're a wealthy district we now are getting less after we worked so hard to get the mill levy but i do have one question and it's just from slide four when you talk about the ongoing funding and i i don't know who can answer this so how long has ongoing funding been going for rural districts is it a monetary a percentage or how do they do that for and and my other question is rural districts is it a certain amount of kids or population um if you're considered rural or is it just your location rural is defined by the number of students you have in your district okay. i believe i believe the ongoing revenue for rurals is 35 million but i can tell from the look on director meek's face that she probably knows better than i do what the ongoing revenue is for rural districts 
I believe it's been appropriated each year for the past four or five years around 35 million. What this change is doing is actually putting it into Correct. the formula. And I actually do have a little cheat sheet here. So <laughs> there's small rural and rural. I think small rural is under 6,500 students, I think. Um, small rural would get $470 per pupil or at least $100,000. So if they don't have enough to add up to 100,000, a small rural district would get 100,000, which would essentially help them with, it, say, a teacher or so. Um, large rurals, it's 177 per pupil or at least 100,000. So it's putting it into the formula so they don't have to advocate for it year after year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that better explanation than I gave. <laughs> Anyone else before we start discussing the resolution? Great, thank you. All right, so um, I'm sure everyone has had an opportunity to look at the resolution that's been proposed. And I don't think I need to read it word for word, but if there's anyone who, let's just start with the whereas statements. Are there any changes that anybody sees that they would like to make to the whereas statements? Director Meek. Yeah, I just have one suggestion for an addition to a whereas, which would be this added after the first. So I'll read the first and then I'll add what I suggest. So whereas the Colorado Speaker of the House and advocacy organizations are presently developing a proposal to change the way Colorado's public schools are funded starting in the 2025-26 school year. And <clears throat> whereas predictable and sustainable funding is crucial for effective long-term planning and investment in our schools. So I suggest adding that as a second whereas, and then continuing with the next one where it talks about the impact. Sorry, could we, I'm trying to write it yeah. all down. So if we could just go a little bit. Predictable and sustainable funding. Predictable and sustainable funding is crucial for effective long-term planning and investment in our schools. My rationale behind that is really just emphasizing, you know, we plan based on our funding and shifting around the funding really is impacting our long-term planning for what we have promised the voters and what we've been able to do. That was my rationale. Could you just, after long-term okay. planning, what are the last words? So, long-term planning and investment in our schools. Great, any comments on, on that, Director Geiger? Um, any of us who's worked on any budget at any time understands that not knowing what your budget's gonna be next year um, makes it almost impossible to, to make the plans we need. We can't, it, it's diff we need to be able to tell our teachers what we're going to pay for them. I don't know how small districts do it. I know it's hard enough in our district. Um, and we know how hard it is to find teachers, and that's not going to change. So to advocate for consistency um, and predictability is vital. There's, just, there's no other way to do business. No companies do it this way. Everybody does five-year projections. And for us to look at changing, it feels like year to year is simply not sustainable, to use the word in the, so I said, I recommend adopting that whereas. Director Thompson. Well, if, I guess if anybody else has comments about that whereas, I just have an addition. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with Director Geiger. I mean, you can't without predictable and sustainable funding, yes. Go ahead, Director Thompson, for another one. Uh, yep, so uh, really the thing that I found most compelling was that we have the adequacy study not until 2025. Um, and I think that that might be worth mentioning as one of the whereas, the adequacy study won't, isn't set to be complete until the 2025 session. Mm -hmm. Do you have- Go ahead. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I had similar thinking. I would put that as 
E, three E. So add that oh, to the bottom there. It's one so, of the therefore, now therefore. Mm -hmm. okay. Any changes to the school funding formula takes into account the results of the adequacy, adequacy study on Colorado school funding scheduled to be completed prior to the 2025 legislative session. That resolves my concern. Okay. Any thoughts on that addition from any director, Director Geiger? I concur. Why do a study, why change before a study? None of that makes sense to me. Could you read it one more time? <laughs> Any changes to school funding formula takes into account the results of the adequacy study on Colorado school funding scheduled to be completed prior to the 2025 legislative session. Okay. Do you have any other ones? <laughs> Just one more. Okay. Um, so I suggest adding a number four under now therefore be it resolved. Okay. That the board and superintendent actively engages with its local representatives or our, I guess, local representatives and state officials to ensure their understanding of the critical need for a long-term sustainable funding stream to support all Colorado students in our public schools. Could you repeat that last sentence? Sure. I think it's one sentence. It's one yeah. very long yeah, sentence. Right. So. Um, you can start at the beginning because I missed the middle. I got the end. Okay. <laughs> the board actively, the board and superintendent actively engages with our local representatives and state officials to ensure their understanding of the critical need for a long-term sustainable funding stream to support all Colorado students in our public schools. Any stream. funding stream. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, any comments on that one? I um, will be honest and say that I struggle a little bit with the whole asking for a statewide um, increase simply because we don't have a bill in front of us and where does that take from? What does that do? And um, when you look at some of the, the measures that have been, been put forward in the past, the money doesn't really come back to Douglas County. It generally goes like every $5 that each resident puts in, um, a very, very small percentage comes back to Douglas County. And so I personally struggle with the number four. The other two I'm good with, but with the number four, I, I struggle with that one. A perhaps solution to that may be number four, but we add um, affordable, sustainable, and equitable funding stream. 
I think that we need to make sure that we're adding Douglas County in there somewhere. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Director Meek. I appreciate hearing that. I, th I think we receive about half of our funding from the state. Um, if I, it was 60%. I think as our local has gone up, it's, it's getting closer to 50, is that correct? Yeah. Um, if we receive more state funding, it would benefit us. And you're right, there would be a redistribution probably, probably something like all the superintendents worked on in 2018, and they all came to agreement that that distribution was an equitable distribution. They all worked on it together and came to that resolution. And so I, I just don't see any way ever moving forward and trying to meet all students' needs without more funding and then all of the soups working together on an equitable, sustainable, what was the other one, Director Geiger? Sustainable, equitable. Affordable, sustainable, and equitable. Affordable, yeah. I would support those three. Director Weiniger. Um, a part that I am wondering about is the part where you say um, we'll engage with them to ensure their understanding of the critical need. I wonder if a more um, nicer, better way of putting that is um, a mutual understanding, um, just so it feels like we're not telling them what they need to do. It's more of like we're coming together to agree. I'm not sure. I agree. On that. I like that a lot. Yeah. A mutual understanding. Mutual to ensure. I'm sorry, Superintendent Kane. Just in terms of language, um, may I recommend to ensure a common understanding? Thank you. Um, oof. <laughs> this one's hard for me because I, I really struggle without an actual bill or a measure in front of me to, to say that I want to advocate um, advocate for that. I just I, I don't know that I can that I can do that. But I, if you wanted to just a suggestion, I'm I don't know that I will support this either way. But Douglas County students and all Colorado students, um, just that way we're mentioning Douglas County. But again, I, I really struggle without something physically in front of me to see what that looks like to be advocating for it. That's just me. I'm fine with adding Douglas County into that statement. And I honestly, this isn't advocating for any bill. This is just saying that we are, as a board and the superintendent, are committing to working with our legislators to come to a common understanding around a, a critical need for long-term funding for schools, affordable, sustainable. You know, I think this is committing us, you know, I have a hard time just saying no. You know, no, this isn't fair, no, this isn't fair. I'd like to have the ability to try to make connections and common understandings with our legislators who are ultimately the ones who will be passing any bill in the future, but this really isn't putting any bill on the table. It's just committing us to say we'll right. be I think active. That's, I think that's where I'm struggling is that I, I'm not, without a bill in front of me, it's hard to say I'm going to advocate for this when I don't know what that looks like. So that's just, that's just where I am. Director, I'm sorry, did you have your hand up, Director Thompson? Just real uh, quick, um, not having adequate state level funding, right, does increase our reliance on bonds and MLOs and what you know, the amounts that those would be. So it is a benefit to at least the, the, the fairness for our local taxpayers. We think about it just from that perspective. Director Moore. Yeah, the, the part 
that I'm struggling with is a resolution that tells the state or <clears throat> hints at, without directly saying it, that we want the state to create an additional funding source. And if that's not what we intend, maybe we can clear, clarify that. I don't have a, a piece of language to offer to, to clarify that. But it feels like we're saying we want an additional funding stream that solves this problem when the problem really revolves around the formula and really the priority that education gets from the state in conjunction with other priorities that they may have. And then as things constantly evolve, the education priority seems to get pushed down and down and down. And instead of adequate funding being allocated at the expense of something else, education is what loses other things when, and then the solution is an additional funding source again. And I just, I'm, I, I'm concerned about relying on the state to, to, to really do that, number one. And number two, is that really what we intend to say? That's what it felt like we were trying to say, and I don't know if that's what we intend to say. Director Meek. Yeah, I mean, this is great. It's really helpful to be able to have this conversation. I believe currently education takes about one of every $4 of the state's budget. Like, it's, it's a large portion of the state budget where I don't think there are other programs that could be cut to give education more. So really my intent behind, my rationale behind trying to include language here is I think it is really complex and I think most individuals um, really don't understand. And when things are complex, it's really easy just to kind of make statements and brush it aside. I think if we believe a long-term sustainable funding stream to meet the needs of the students that we're here to serve as well is important, committing to engage with our legislators in really developing just an understanding. It doesn't mean we're all gonna land on the same page and come to agreement but I think it's a it's an education in relationship building. So back to my original point is are we intending intending to message that we want an additional form of funding? That's not in, in the language. It may be implied. It may be that the legislature needs to find other ways to, to prioritize education. As a taxpayer, I have one viewpoint. As a citizen, I have another. As a member of this board, I was elected to prioritize one thing, and that's education. And I don't think a part of the resolution that says, let's talk to the people who represent us downtown about how important it is that this be affordable, sustainable, predictable, and equitable, Imp ties us to any particular funding mechanism or even to a new funding mechanism. Our re legislators will make, other will make those decisions. I don't read this as saying we support some new funding stream because there's no mention of a new funding stream. I support it as saying that engagement that, how do I put this? The only people who can make this change are first the legislature and then the voters. Because this is not gonna, under Tabor, any new funding stream has to come from the voters. But we have to engage with our legislators and say that the current process isn't working for our schools. And that's all this says to me, is that we are going to continue to talk to our legislators on a regular basis that this process putting it up, changing the formulas, which we can do without voters, is the wrong way to do it. And that we have to engage in a good faith effort to find the best way to make education a top priority. It doesn't mean we have to pass a new tax. It may mean that. And if it comes down to a specific tax proposal, 
We'll discuss that at a different time. But I don't, I don't, I'm not concerned about saying we need to go to our representatives and our senators and say this needs to be a priority. And that's all I read this to say. And that's what I want this to say. And if there are ways that we can make this feel more like that, then let's talk about that language. But I firmly and will continually say, as elected officials, one of the few, you know, the seven of us are one of 10 people elected countywide. Okay? We have a duty to deal with what's best for this county. And we need to engage for those people elected as part of Douglas County who can make the changes and say, this isn't working. And I don't think anybody on here thinks the current process is the best we can come up with. Sorry, I'm just trying to yes. think about what would make me feel comfortable, how it do because you, to me, it's to, to me saying the critical need of a long-term funding stream does insinuate the the addition of that, and perhaps that's not funding process. Um, what it's intended to do. Um, and if it's not, then that's great. Then let's maybe work on different verbiage. Would you be comfortable with funding, a funding process or procedure? or just funding formula. I mean, that's really what we're talking about is really the formula the state uses and clearly wants to, you know, there's some desire to amend that, but at what cost? We just don't feel that the formula is equitable as Director Geiger mentioned. And I don't disagree with the intent that right. Director Meek is trying to represent. I just wanted to be clear that we're not asking for an additional funding source we're looking at, at this stage, and, and maybe I'm reading into it too much, and if I am, I apologize, but that's just how it felt. Yeah, sorry, that's why, where I was kind of sitting as well. So I just want to make sure that, how do you feel about formula versus stream? I can definitely live with formula. I think my intent here is working with our, legislators and state officials to talk about what it means to have sustainable, equitable, affordable, like all of those are really important. And I think that really is the intent behind this. Okay, so how about uh, the board and superintendent actively engages with our local representatives and state officials to ensure a common understanding of the critical need of equitable and affordable of, uh, of an equitable and affordable funding formula to support all Douglas County and Colorado students in our public schools. Sustainable too. Sorry, sustainable. Yeah. Equitable, affordable, and sustainable. Okay. Director Myers. And I think I would agree with formula over streaming. The minute I hear, heard the stream, I'm thinking, okay, another tax. Where do we get our money from? We have to tax. So formula works for me. All right, so do I need to read it one more time? Or does everyone feel good? All right, so, um, all right, we'll start from the beginning, and if I get words wrong, please stop me. Whereas, Colorado Speaker of the House and advocacy organizations are presently developing a proposal to change the way Colorado's public schools are funded starting in the 25-26 school year, and whereas predictable and sustainable funding are crucial for effective long-term planning and investment in our schools. Whereas, the impact of proposed revisions to Colorado's public school funding will have financial consequences to the Douglas County School District RE1 
and consequently the quality of educational services which can and will be provided to the district students in the future and whereas adequate base funding for our district as well as Colorado school districts is important to assure that students in our district and in Colorado receive a high quality education responsive to the needs of each learner and whereas Senate Bill 24-188 introduced last week addresses the financing of public school districts in Colorado for the upcoming 24-25 school year and continues to fund schools and school districts under the current funding formula while also providing ongoing funding support for Colorado's rural school districts. And whereas the district's Board of Education is elected to advocate for the best interests of the students, staff, parents, and taxpayers of Douglas County, and whereas the board desires to specifically address Colorado legislative efforts to amend public school finance formula. Now, therefore, be it resolved. One, the board fully supports the present terms of Senate Bill 24-188 addressing the financing of public schools and school districts in Colorado for the upcoming 24-25 school year under the current funding formula. Number two, that the board recognizes the need for additional funding to support historically underfunded rural school districts and supports the inclusion of this funding in Senate Bill 24-188. Number three, that any legislative proposals to amend the formulas for financing Colorado's public school districts are consistent with the following goals. A, funding Colorado's public school districts adequately so that each and every learner in our district in the state of Colorado has the potential to receive a high quality education that is responsive to individualized student needs. B, prioritizing adequate and sustainable base funding for Colorado's school district that is increased by at least inflation each year per the provisions in Amendment 23. C, funding the needs of individual learners once an adequate base is established and sustainably funded, including students with special education needs, students experiencing poverty, and students acquiring English language skills. D, providing a providing for a sustainable statewide ongoing funding source that provides a strong return on investment for Douglas County taxpayers so that our district and all Colorado school districts can confidently rely upon adequate state support for educational programs into the future. E, any changes to the school funding formula takes into account the results of the advocacy funding scheduled to be completed in the 25-26 school year. Is that right? Um, adequacy study is a study, sorry. study yep. on Colorado school funding scheduled to be completed prior Schedule. to the 2025 legislative session. All right, one more time. So for some reason I'm struggling on. <laughs> Any changes to the school funding formula takes into account the results of the advocacy study on Colorado school funding scheduled to be completed prior to the 25 legislative session. Yes. And number four, the board and superintendent actively engages with our local represent, re, representatives and state officials to ensure a common understanding of the critical need of an equitable, affordable, and sustainable funding formula to support all Douglas County and Colorado students in our public schools. I move to adopt the resolution as amended. Second. Motion by Geiger, second by Meek. Roll call, Geiger. Aye. Meek. Aye. Moore. Yes. Myers. Aye. Thompson. Aye. Williams, aye. Weiniger. Aye. Passes seven to zero. Thank you very much for that discussion. Um, and sorry for my struggle on writing it all out. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, all right. So moving on to agenda item number eight, adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. Motion by Geiger. Second. Second by Weiniger. Roll call, Geiger. Aye. Meek. Aye. Moore. Aye. Myers. Aye. Thompson. Aye. Williams. Aye. Weiniger. Aye. Great. The Board of Education is now adjourned.